The French Empire once stood as one of the most formidable in human history, exercising control over nearly 10% of the world's total land mass, stretching from Southeast Asia to West Africa, France, a nation often associated with fashion and cinema today, held a position of immense global influence. This influence was particularly pronounced on the African continent, where they governed territories encompassing what are now 17 independent nations, ranging from Morocco to the Congo, operating under the guise of a civilizing mission. They presided over ruthless occupations that enriched the empire at the expense of ordinary Africans. This dark chapter in history was written by practices such as slavery, resource extraction, and violence. Astonishingly, remnants of France's African empire persist even today, though in a more streamlined, profit-oriented, and arguably more exploitative guise, allow us to elaborate this matter further. Following the conclusion of the Second World War, a wave of decolonization movements began sweeping across Africa and Asia. In the wake of their defeat and occupation by the Nazis, the French were determined to retain their empire. Consequently, they responded to uprising in Algeria, Indochina, and Madagascar with harsh and punitive actions. The task of maintaining control over foreign territories became increasingly challenging. By the year 1960, they found themselves compelled to grant independence to nearly all of its colonies. However, a pivotal development took place in Africa. Essentially, the leadership of France decided to maintain their influence in Western and Central Africa while officially relinquishing their colonial status. The strategy was straightforward. Upon gaining independence, African nations were required to enter into what were termed cooperation agreements with it, describing the nature of their ongoing relations. In exchange for French foreign aid, these African countries were obligated to grant its rights over their natural resources, permit the continuous presence of French troops on their soil, and, most significantly, peg their currencies to its currencies, the franc. Rather than having their own independent currencies, these nations were mandated to utilize the franc of the financial community of Africa, now referred to as the CFA franc. Franc presented these cooperation agreements as a choice, but the consequences of defiance were made abundantly clear. When Guinea's leader, a socialist named Secutore refused to accept the cooperation agreement with France and boldly declared that he preferred poverty in freedom over wealth in slavery. The French government chose to set an example using punitive measures. They immediately cut off all foreign aid to Guinea and actively sought to destabilize the government to achieve this. They initiated a covert campaign to produce counterfeit Guinean banknotes and overpower the country with them. A French spy later boasted about the operation's success, noting that Guinea's already fragile economy never fully recovered from the blow. It referred to these nations as part of the so-called French community, but this policy would eventually become more widely accepted as Franc Afrique. Its primary objective was to position former colonies in a way that maximally served French interests. Many of these initial post-colonial leaders in these former French colonies had essentially been hand-picked and groomed by the French. They were fluent in French, had spent time in France, and had strong connections with French elites. Jacques Focart, a French diplomat, held the responsibility of overseeing French-African relations for nearly three decades. During his tenure, he carefully constructed a vast network of client relationships with African leaders, often employing methods of corruption and covert operations to ensure their loyalty as subordinates. 
when local political stability was jeopardized, the French were not hesitant to intervene militarily to protect their carefully chosen dictators. Since 1960, France had conducted over 50 military interventions in Africa. An illustrative case can be found in the Central African nation of Gabon. Gabon holds particular significance for France due to its abundant reserves of oil and uranium. Historically, among the African colonies, Gabon maintained an exceptionally close relationship with them. In 1967, Omar Bongo assumed the presidency of Gabon, subsequently transforming the country into a one-party dictatorship. Bongo's rise to power was intimately linked with France, and he essentially secured his position after traveling to Paris for what could be likened to a job interview with the French president. Under Bongo's rule, France and Gabon nurtured a relationship that primarily benefited their respective elites. The French state-owned oil company ELF was responsible for extracting Gabon's oil, while its uranium contributed to their nuclear weapons arsenal. In return, they provided financial subsidies to Gabon, particularly channeling significant portions into the coffers of Omar Bongo and his family. At one point, Bongo's personal wealth exceeded $130 million, while Gabon itself remained poor and underdeveloped. During Bongo's regime, the country grappled with one of the highest infant mortality rates globally. Rather than investing in Gabon's economic development, Bongo allocated state funds to influence French politics in his favor, financing the campaigns of several future French presidents. Even today, French troops are stationed in the country to support Gabon's current leader, who happens to be Omar Bongo's son. Gabon's situation is relatively more favorable compared to some other countries, such as the Central African Republic, which are among the world's poorest. This predicament is partly attributed to the enduring legacies of French-backed dictators like Jean Bidel Bocassa. However, there's another aspect of French influence that holds even greater significance. Arguably, the most pivotal component in this equation is the CFA franc, which happens to be the last colonial currency still widely used. In practical terms, nations that rely on the CFA franc possess minimal monetary sovereignty. Their currency's value is tied to the euro. Essentially, the world's poorest nations find themselves subject to the currency control of the wealthiest countries. Consequently, the imperatives of European nations, characterized by fiscal discipline and the battle against inflation, unintentionally shaped the economic landscape of Western and Central Africa, despite the vast differences between these regions. This arrangement results in an overly strict approach to credit, a critical factor for economic growth within our current system. Furthermore, it means that any increase in the value of the euro renders exports from these African nations less competitive in terms of pricing. A sad example can be drawn from Senegal's experience. During the period from 2000 to 2009, when the euro strengthened against the dollar, the value of the CFA franc also rose. Nonetheless, this led to local Senegalese rice becoming more expensive than imported rice from Thailand. Consequently, Senegal which aspired to develop its domestic rice industry, witnessed Thai rice inundating the market and displacing local rice farmers. Due to the high cost of domestic products, achieving export-driven growth, which is essential for lifting a country out of poverty, becomes nearly unattainable. This is why most countries using the CFA franc experience significantly lower growth rates compared to their neighbors the CFA franc system discourages the development of domestic industries, causing many of these economies to actually shrink. For instance, the Ivory Coast, the largest CFA franc country, has a real GDP per capita one-third lower than it had in 1978. Similarly, the other CFA franc countries like Cameroon and the Republic of the Congo reached their highest levels of real GDP per capita in the 70s and 80s. 
Furthermore, because economic growth is stunted, there is a greater incentive for local elites in these countries who are often closely connected to French multinational corporations to siphon off as much money as possible. Billions of dollars have flowed out of these countries and into shell corporations or foreign bank accounts due to extensive corruption. Consequently, these African elites have become part of the global super rich. As an example, in 2007, Omar Bongo's daughter-in-law made headlines by purchasing an LA mansion for $25 million on VH1. The French elites also benefit significantly from this arrangement. They enjoy access to natural resources at lower costs and receive kickbacks from dubious business deals, notably a French billionaire named Vincent Bellore, now controls most of the major ports across West Africa. In France, Bellore is famously referred to as the King of Africa. Consequently, French influence in Africa has never truly faded away, giving rise to the term neocolonialism in academic discourse. While the overbranding of empire may have diminished, the structures facilitating economic extraction have only strengthened over time. This modern form of neocolonialism is remarkably efficient in its exploitation, as France no longer feigns interest in fostering functional governance or improving local living standards. Instead, the focus is solely on extraction. Therefore, it's crucial to recognize that these African nations aren't simply underdeveloped. They're in fact overexploited. Their economic power is heavily reliant on its influence in Africa. As Italy's foreign minister aptly put it, if France didn't have its African colonies because that's what they should be called, it would be the 15th largest world economy. Instead, it's among the first, precisely because of its actions in Africa. The French are acutely aware of this reality. Former French President Francois Mitterrand openly acknowledged, without Africa, they will have no history in the 21st century. In contemporary times, France faces increasing competition from China in Africa, along with challenges to the colonial symbolism of the CFA franc. Efforts are being made to change the currency's name and shed the most overt colonial symbols, creating the illusion of a more African rather than French system. However, France harbors no intention of abandoning a system of extraction that has catapulted it into one of the world's wealthiest nations. The pivotal question lies in whether the next generation of Africans will permit the perpetuation of this system, or if the next generation of Africans will reshape the future of their country and their continent.